the trick to not falling or tripping over is to touch the floor and take its blessings. It will be kind to you. Mere paas aao mere dosto, ek golpo suno, kahani suno, kissa suno, ek story suno. How do you select stories? Now that's one question that I'm asked often. And really I don't have a simple answer for it. Because selecting a story for me sometimes is like navigating through a very complex algorithm of factors. You know, age group, how many children will there be, how many adults will there be, um, what do they like, what do they don't like, Ugh, too much to explain. So I try to sound very intelligent and I say, I don't select stories, stories select me. Well, it's really true. Let me tell you one of them. Her day began like any other. All of 17, but she still needed her father to wake her up every day in the morning to go to school. A Nobel laureate, an activist for education and children's particularly girls' rights, but still a child who fought with her brothers. She stood in front of the windows and looked out. There in front of her were tall buildings, long roads with cars driving in straight lines, neat green hedges and lawns, and tiny pavements for people to walk on almost idyllic. The calm and quietude of Birmingham was growing on her. She had started school and had just about started to make friends. But Moniva was still her best friend. But just the other day, the two friends connected on Skype and they were talking about their life. And when Moniva said, oh, Malala, you should have been here. You would have laughed so much. <laughs> Malala hung up. She couldn't control her urge to go back home. She took a deep breath and shut her eyes. And for a moment, she was back in her valley. The snow-capped mountains, the green waving fields, and the clear blue rivers. Her mind, her mind starts to play tricks with her. In a moment, she's transported back to her home, to her city, to her school, where she's reunited with her friends and her teachers. And she sits with Moniba, holding hands and talking and laughing like they did way back. Like that day when they were returning home in that van from school. That van, the van stops with a jolt and all the girls, they fall on each other laughing and giggling, rubbing shoulders. When a bearded man, he gets up on the van and he looks at all of them and says, who's Malala? None of them say anything, but several heads turn towards her. Malala is the only one with her face not covered. The man picks up her gu his gun and someone screams. He tries to steady his hand so it doesn't shake. Malala squeezes Moniba's hand. A bang and a flash and smoke and Malala's life goes crashing down a deep dark hole. It took me more than three months of reading, research, writing and rehearsing to put this story into a performance. It's an incredible, extraordinary story of a girl with lots of courage and was very difficult for me. But I was ready. I was ready just in time for World Storytelling Day where the theme was strong women. And I thought Malala's story is the perfect story to tell young girls and boys about what it really means to be fighting for education. So I took the story to a school in Greater Noida where I had about 350 children across grades third to fifth and I told them the story for the first time. And I was, I was telling them, like I'm talking to you all of you, you have all your eyes on me. I had my eyes on them, looking at all the faces. And I saw waves of shock, awe, fear, bravado, panic. 
all these waves sweeping across these faces. One by one, every child crossed over into Malala's world. A world very different and far away from the world that they were living in. A world no one had talked to them about. A girl not very different from them, but still with a story that was absolutely unlike theirs. So, what do you think? I said, you know, snapping out, crossing over to the side of the ring, waiting for my listeners to take on, come onto the stage and start sharing. Because after a story, children of all ages, they are bubbling with so many things to say, so many things to ask. But they were all speechless, blank. No one stirred. And I looked at all their faces and I said, a moment ago, they were all soaking in every word I was saying. They were hanging on to every syllable. What's wrong? Did they not understand the story? I mean, how could I go so wrong in reading my audience? I needed to know what's going on in the head. So I said, OK, let's do something else. So I gave them pieces of paper, you know, small pieces of paper, and I said, write anything that you want to. Imagine you're writing a note to Malala. Write anything. And that opened the floodgates. And all the children, they started writing such poignant notes about how they felt, that they heard the story and what's going on in their head. They said they admired her courage. Some said, I hope you go back to Pakistan, to your home, to your school, to your friends someday. You will. Some asked, do you like your new school? Do you like the new teachers? Well, one kid, one particular kid said, Dear Malala, I hope you come to India. We have lots of children who don't go to school, too. And this paper is too small for me to write what I feel right now. My story had reached home. After this, we talked a lot about a child's right to go to school, not just in our country, but all across the world. And in our own little ways, we resolved to try and do anything that we can to ensure that all children go to school. Two years back, I performed this story for the first and the last time. Yes, I'm guilty. I feel this is a story that should be told to each and every child across the world. But I cannot revisit it. I don't have it in me. I don't have the courage to tell this story. You see, when I tell a story, I go through the same crests and troughs of emotions like all listeners do, sometimes more, if not less. And my job as a storyteller is to control my emotions, right? If I start crying and weeping in the middle of a story, I'll snap, I'll snap out of that story for that moment. So while I deeply admire Malala's fearlessness and her courage and her valor, the parent in me is very scared. I don't think the parent in me has the courage that her father showed in letting his daughter stand up against the Taliban. Would I have the fortitude required to let my son stand up against anyone who's holding a gun? Maybe not. To be a storyteller is to use a story to connect with the listeners, with the audience, to create a world where I want my audience to cross over and enter. It is to communicate the journey of a character in such a convincing way that it feels like your own, like you're going through the conflict yourself. Yes? And it is to convince you to derive meaning, to take inspiration to ideas, to lessons, like we say, from the story, from the resolution of that conflict. And if I want my audience to go through all of this, I have to first cross over and enter that world, journey through it as a storyteller, and come out. It's th because of this that I feel that storytelling will be the strongest currency in the world. It will be the dominant mode of exchange of how everyone leads their lives. People will use stories to influence others' beliefs, emotions, behavior, and action. And it is because of this, with my Malala story, I'm not willing to make that exchange yet.
and that's why it's very difficult for me to tell it. Think of Subhash Chandra Bose when he said, give me blood and I'll give you freedom. Or when Martin Luther King Jr. said, I have a dream. Leaders across the world have relied on storytelling to rouse millions of people across the world. They've all told a future story of world, what the world will be like to connect, communicate, and convince people to action. Stories act as rewards, as reminders. They act as threats and warnings for people. Stories can be the truth or the truth that you want people to believe in. Stories can be the fact that you choose to ignore or the fantasy that you choose to believe. And in telling each of these stories, you're using it as a currency to connect, communicate, and convince people to do anything. And it is true, very, very true, in the times that we live in. So let me tell you another story. Yeah? Not so long ago, in a world not too far from our own, there was a little boy called Alan. And Alan loved to play at the beach because it meant rolling on the sand with his brother, chasing the waves, riding on the sand, waiting for the waters to wash them away. One day at dusk, the brothers sat with their father, listening to the waves wash their toes and watching the sun set and the birds fly towards the horizon. Where are they going? asked three-year-old Alan. Oh, the father raised his hands and he said, oh, they are flying to warmer skies away from the harsh winter. No one knew it more than Abdullah, the father. After all, he was looking for safer skies that didn't spew fire. He was looking for a city safe and secure away from the violence of their home in Damascus. He was looking for a home that was not rattled by gunshots and bombs. A sleep that was not interrupted. The mother's lullabies were not interrupted by violence and sloganeering on the streets. He was looking for a childhood for his children, full of laughter and not fear. It's going to be an adventure, boys, the father promised. There are going to be whales and fishes. There are going to be dolphins and sharks. And there will be turtles and jellyfish. Don't look down into the water or touch it. Or they'll all want to ride. Ghalib, the older one, said, Can we take a fish for a bowl? Only if we have room on the ship, said Abdullah. But it was nothing like a ship. It was a small rubber inflatable boat. It had room for about eight people, but another eight moved in and they all huddled together to make room. It was to be a perilous journey, one that very few made through. But there was no turning back. So on one early September morning, the family huddled together for one last time, praying to the sea to take them to safe shores. But the waters were friendly. They wanted to play with the boys like they always did. So they rose and they fell, turning the boat over into the deep, cold waters of the Mediterranean Sea. Like countless other refugees lost in sea, Alan would still have been just another statistic had we not watched that horrific picture of his little body being washed up on Kurdish beach. He still had his shoes on and he was finally at rest, listening to his mother's lullabies forever. Now, I had chosen to shut my eyes, my ears, and my heart to Alan Kurdi's story until I heard it last month in Iran. I was there for a festival, and on the opening day, I sat on the seat with an eager, giddy-headed listener listening to stories like a little kid. 
when the first act of the festival really shocked me. In an auditorium filled with primary school children, this was a story that I wouldn't choose if I was the festival director. But I was in Iran, a country that revered its martyrs. And what followed after the story was very interesting. There was a dichotomy of opinions between two very seasoned and celebrated storytellers. One of them felt that this was a beautiful rendition. And it is a story that ought to be told to children who are growing up in conflict region themselves. While the other storyteller felt it was very high on propaganda. Listening to stories of conflict and suffering, he believed, has a deep impact on the listener's sense of victimhood and therefore the need for sacrifice and martyrdom. So the question is, do these stories reinforce the perceptions that people have grown up with or do they take them away from those perceptions? And it is in these situations that a storyteller can really use the story as a currency to peddle truth or fantasy, to peddle history, a painful history, or a beautiful future. Stories can move mountains if you believe in them. Stories can create storms in the calmest of seas. Stories can be used as a currency to influence, to inspire, or even to instruct. Stories can really put a generation to sleep, or it can arouse them to action. No matter who you are today, or who you will be from time to come, a student, a teacher, a professor, a librarian, an author, a business leader, an entrepreneur. Whether you choose a story or a story chooses you, the question is, what will you ask for in return of it? How will you tell that story? Consider this before you tell any story in your life. Thank you.